trucks. Happy New Year, truckos. Truckos. We are recording this on December 14th, which seems like the last reasonable time that we might be able to do it. Um, I am deep in the throes of holiday hell at the post office, uh, so forgive me if I'm even less coherent than usual. Um, I feel like as if I've been broken down uh, <laughs> to my component parts. Um, wow. I have two trailers. Nope, just one very simple. <laughs> Walbert. Uh, I've managed to screw up uh, reheating um, some Japanese curry and, and cooking some rice in two distinct ways. Uh, and that's probably the easiest thing to do in the world. Oh, shall we just go down the hill? <laughs> yeah, that seems like a good shortcut. Yep. I don't None know of that is a real town that I hear is real. To, look at all of that. Yeah, no, that's all. That's all completely fake. So, anyway, uh, not to worry, truckers. We will be following up the Yuri trucks with a uh, Yowie trucks in the new year, assuming that we can get uh, everybody who has volunteered to participate in, into the room. Um, that'll be a rollicking good time, I'm sure. Uh, but for now, we're just gonna look back over the year. We're not going to do any top tens or whatever because neither of us really experienced any uh, media. Um, and I guess that is the case in point, perhaps, as far as our years have gone, is that we're... we're, we're <laughs> <laughs> I, well, this is not really true, but what I'm going to say is that we're much less of nerds than we used to be. Well, I mean, you must speak for yourself there, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, I find that my... My general time is measured no longer by media I have consumed. With one exception, perhaps, this year. Well, I could think of a couple of exceptions, I guess. I mean, you still do play a fair amount of Tekken, if I'm not mistaken. I certainly do play a fair amount of Tekken, but that is not something that I can use to distinguish this year from any other. That is true. That is merely the, the long now. And the video game mm -hmm. that I think I've played most this year is... I got back into Binding of Isaac shamefully, and that absolutely does not distinguish this year from any other year. Um, I'm really getting into the big boy ranks in Tekken. That uh, that could be a this year thing, I guess. Yeah, no, that's that's personally exciting, certainly. But yeah, no, I'm no longer excited by new releases for the most part. There are a precious few artists whose work that I really uh, hanker after more of. Yeah. Um, it's going to upset you, Isaac, but I think that my most important media consumption experience this year was revisiting the Lord of the Rings films. Yeah, yeah. No, Monica was uh, mentioning that um, you rewatched those. Did, mm -hmm. Does this include The Hobbit or just the Lord of the Rings films themselves? No, yeah, just the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Mm -hmm. First time I've really watched those movies since I was a child and they were new. And, First, um, I mean, I haven't watched them since I was a teen, teenager or early college student yeah, or yeah. however old I was when they came out. What I will say is that, um, you know, I've since watching those movies for the first time, like, gotten into film craft. And, uh, you know, sometimes people will say about those movies, gosh, they don't make them like that anymore. And I have to say, no, that's wrong. They never made them like that ever, except for this <laughs> trilogy. Like... The sheer amount of stuff that they came up with in order to make these movies is full-on ridiculous. It's basically like the nation of New Zealand got together into a, a World War II style effort of invention and manpower and made some fancy movies. They're pretty wow. good. Yeah. I can't even feign interest in that, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, as you pointed too out. Bad. Yeah, no. Um, so what What? Uh, what exactly... No, no, I can't even... I can't. <laughs> okay, I'll feign interest I, in I'm, your no, things instead. Nah, Go I'm, ahead. I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> um, I'm joking about token. Uh, token joking over here. So is it... Is it the like the narrative or just the craft that you were responding to in these rewatches? Bit of both, yeah. Mm -hmm. Bit of both, kind of, not not kind of, somewhat independent of one another, I suppose. You sure, know, sure. That's two. Those are the two things that are interesting about the movie. Maybe the craft is more interesting than the narrative. I don't know. The narrative is cool, 
It's, um, yeah, it's good, I think. I mean, like, you and I once began recording and then didn't release a Trux where we took on the issue of, like, the racialization as a plot device that takes place in those books. Oh, wow, did um, we? I have no memory yeah. of that at all. Um, yeah, no, that's definitely a thing. I think that's been well established and discussed. Uh, sure, sure. On many levels. that the, And, I mean, I've spent this lot, like, the thing that I've spent this last year consuming more than anything else is uh, contemporary fantasy for the other mm -hmm. podcasts that I do. Um, and Tolkien's legacy lives on um, particularly among people who should know better yes about uh racializing um evil essentially uh, right. <laughs> you know and he did that and that became hugely influential in creative terms and you know what can you do it's like complaining yes, it's about shame. star wars and it's mostly deleterious effect on the culture and movie making um mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But we can we can leave that aside from here. Uh, tell tell me what makes what exactly it is if you can about the these movies that they didn't make them like that ever. What is the thing that they do that nobody else has done? It's, is it the sheer vastness of them? Yeah, the scale, um, and not just the scale of the narrative, but the scale of like what they did to make them. Mm. Uh, like they, you know. They, they had to make the main characters look short <laughs> in all of these scenes, just for instance. So what they did to do that was build so many of the sets, like two or three separate times with identical props, just everything on a different scale, so they could film things and composite them together. But not only that, they, they also used forced perspective, and there were new techniques in forced perspective, like things where uh, part of, parts of the set were like, wired up or I don't I can't like all kinds of crazy pulley mechanisms so that when the camera moved the furniture would move and the actors would move and it would all just look seamless but it's all just like a mobile forced perspective they designed like big things on like big stilt walker semi robot suits that people could walk around in so that like figures in the background could like st stroll through the shot and like you know it would look like a, a normal sized person was walking past the little hobbits just right, like they right. came up with five or six new techniques in filmmaking just for that one aspect that the special effects required. Did you, you know? watch and this like, all the commentary tracks on then? I did, I did, yes. Mm. And like the miniatures that they built were ridiculous. The the way the miniatures, like the, yeah, I, I don't know, man, so many things. It, it, it would be dull for me to try to enumerate all of these things and it would also be like a memory recall task that I'm intimidated by right now. But That's fine. I'm, I'm just, people already I'm know, you know. Just like, enough to like get the flavor of it. And it's like, yeah. I think I said to uh, Kiana the other day, um, speaking of things that happened to me this year, the mm -hmm. I have a girlfriend now. Um, yeah, I have a girlfriend now too. I know, it's weird. Uh, the uh that i was um that it's a miracle that movies are any good at all ever because uh the amount of the amount that they cost and the amount of labor that needs to go into them puts them at a massive disadvantage to being good art from the very beginning and so right. i'm clearly on the wrong way of life to appreciate this at the moment you know we we drift uh yeah in That's different the directions cool thing is when that amount of effort can nonetheless cohere into a pretty coherent, in this case, adaptation of a work. But it's an adaptation which clearly... I, I do have some critiques. I think the second movie in particular uh, focuses on a certain, you know, immediately post 9-11 rah-rah militarism in a way mm. that is perhaps present in the book but may not be as you know, significant a portion of the of the thing. Sure. Another Keanism um, is that the three things ruined the American movie. Mm hmm. 9 9 11. Steven Spielberg and Joseph Campbell. <laughs> Joseph Campbell. Yep. 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 And, uh, uh, yeah, I know that we've, of course, gone over the My Dead Wife is 9 11 metaphor. Um, right many a time but even even good old peter jackson was not exempt 
nor the peace-loving nation of New Zealand. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, no. Most of my most of my um, artistic or my media consumption has been sort of these queer revolution slash colonial narratives, um, which I've spoken about at length elsewhere. But like getting really into sort of the niche niggly differences between these books like doing close readings on a bunch of different books inside the same genre has been a really sort of interesting yeah. critical experience uh, because it's it's always fun to like open stuff up and rec and learn a new language of tropes you know mm -hmm. and it's uh, and it touches a bunch of other different trope languages that I'm was not as familiar with before I started with this like romance and yeah, contemporary yeah, yeah. fantasy and all that good stuff and like I wouldn't really hang the good art necklace around most of the books that we've done <laughs> um, like the ambitious failure necklace which is among my favorite necklaces to hang on things would fit around a few of their necks mm -hmm. uh, but you know, they function as, as frameworks for discussion. Um, yeah. At much in the same way that, uh, that we mine these sorts of things for. I would go ahead and say that the Lord of the Rings, both novels and movies, are probably good art. Not without their issues, of course. But, uh, I remember Nick Trotta once challenged me to think of the, like, think of a tale about the nature of good and evil, which is better than Star Wars. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. And um, now it seems to me that The Lord of the Rings is the obvious answer. It has a very coherent vision of what evil means, and it's not just orcs. The orcs, while they're, while they're casting as the evil race, is, you know, not ideal from a modern perspective. It's, it is also clear that they represent, like, the industrialized militarism of modern nations rather than anything, like, backwards and foreign. Well, you know, Tolkien would probably argue that that representation is not blah blah blah, but uh, yeah, the Urukai maybe specifically could represent that. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. What how? What would you say that Tolkien thinks evil is? Um, well, the thirst for power, probably. But compare that to Darth Vader whose notion of evil mostly just seems to be... I mean, what even is it? What is Darth Vader's motivation? I'm not sure. Um, he's a brat. Right. I mean, the, uh, the probably the most coherent moral message that Star Wars puts out is Yoda's, you know, anger leads to hate, hate leads to suffering bit. Mm -hmm. um, Talk about is, victim blaming. Which is not a million miles away from the Dune conception of evil, if you wanted to talk about, you know... I ought to read Dune sometime. What the Bene Gesserit think. Uh, but in terms of, like, a story about a heroic struggle against evil, that's where Lord of the Rings really shines, shines I think. Mm, you get your sword out, and you ride off into Mordor. The hero of the book is, like, the big Frodo, hero. Yes. Is, is Sam, really. It's, uh... Mm. It's the guy who makes the heroic task possible. The Frodo's role is more of sacrificial lamb or something, whereas yeah. Sam is like the key support, and he kind of yeah he plays more he plays more into the archetypal hero roles, which at the time were not defined by Joseph Campbell. They Campbell and Tolkien were contemporaries. Was an interesting thing for me to. It now seems obvious, but that was an right. interesting thing for me to go back and realize. They were both trying to remake the myth, and it must be said, you know, like, Lord of the Rings was written to kind of sound like a classical myth, but its story structure is far better than most classical myths, um, which kind of take on a tone of like, and then he went over here, and this guy oh, needed yeah. help with a funny-shaped rock. And Most classical myths are written by the people, you see, right, rather than right. by, you know... Some scholar. Right, exactly. Uh... The problem with anyway. folk songs is that they were written <laughs> by the people, said Tom Blair. Um, <laughs> anyway, I don't actually want to turn this into a Lord of the Rings trucks, just that's my number one media intake this year. 
Yeah. And I guess the number two media intake that I'll point to is that this was strangely a good year for video games about flying alien vessels over alien landscapes. There were two of them, Jet the Far Shore, XO1. They both share similar strengths and weaknesses, and I'd recommend them both. Um, I'll just leave that there. Fair enough. Yeah, I've played zero new video games. Um, the is that true? I've played. Oh, Deltarune came out this year. Deltarune, um, right? Deltarune Chapter Two came out this year, which I can heartily recommend. It's much better than the first did, uh, than the first bit of Deltarune, and uh, points toward exciting things to come. Um, and uh, yeah. No, I think that uh, Deltarune could potentially be a really impressive sort of masterwork by the time it's finished. Or it could be a fiasco, of course. Um, but I, uh, I had the surreal experience reading one of the... Uh, reading a YA fa fantasy novel um, for the podcast this week in which the uh the hero uh a a trans woman who is sort of a violin prodigy from an abusive household who has to do sort of survival sex work and is taken in by a uh teacher uh who wants to uh take her soul and sell it to the devil um but i there was a scene in which the uh musician is trying to explain a thinly veiled uh, version of Undertale to her teacher and YouTube <laughs> music videos and I'm like holy shit Undertale has been around long enough and was big enough to just immediately turn around and become part of the culture hasn't it yeah. I mean this is a very particular slice of the culture but um, it delighted me to see that um, yeah and I think Speaking of good art, I think Deltarune has the possibility of turning out to be good art, but we won't know for years. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Years and years to come. <laughs> uh, <sighs> that kind of slow drip release can convince us that a thing is good art even when it ultimately turns out not to be. Can it? Yeah, remember Homestuck? Did anybody come out of that thinking that it was good art? Yes. But I more can think of to maybe my one point. person. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, Joey in Pennsylvania. I'm sure there's at least one guy named Joey in Pennsylvania who thinks Home Stark is good art. But yeah. more to the point, it had us all believing that it was good art um, in the years for, before for a good it was long actually time. completed. Yeah, that's true. Now I'm I I uh, I go into the under the Deltarune experience with that lying heavily upon my shoulders, and I'm sure you can appreciate it. And so when I say that it could, yeah. that is all that I mean. Yes. Um, yes. But. So, it seems, I think, the more, really the more, the greater depths of this year will be found in reflections more personal, perhaps. That is here. true, but that is also something that we have uh, historically shied away from. It's true. Uh, we on have. Trucks, although we had a, we had sort of a, a, a series of sort of very introspective, like, therapy-style trucks. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then... We've sort of veered yeah. away. I feel like we. They happened while I was in the midst of a fairly intense therapy experience. That is true. I'm sure that is not coincidental. But now you are. Uh, yes, you've I'm been, post, post. You've therapy been experience. subsumed into the working world. You are now, <laughs> having been through therapy, you are now becoming part of the night. Part of the night, night creatures. You're one of the night creatures now. Um, Although sadly, I'm I'm sad to say that right now I'm mostly working day shifts <laughs> and swing shifts so i <laughs> get out I, I get well, out before midnight for the most part mm. um i that that is a thing that i wish to change eventually because i am still much more comfortable working at night than i am at day but uh you are uh, but you are you have been actually tending bar from time to time mm -hmm. and uh, these days it's yeah it's every week every week i'm tending bar they got me doing a little bit of everything, Isaac. I even have my very own Jetro card, which, for those who don't know, is the is the, one of the wholesale stores around here. It's a Ooh. fucking... What that Jetro card is, my friend, is a license for pain. 
<laughs> <laughs> that that place is just maelstrom. It's like you walk in there and it's instant survival mode. But yeah, I'm I'm the slave at the bar, which is also to say that I'm the man. Dave. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you are. This qualifies you to do just about anything, and it is at least in theory further into the night world that you're hoping to go. Uh, yeah, as this yeah. progresses. Indeed, and mm-hmm. uh, I'm sure that it will happen sooner or later that I'll just get a proper open to close shift all to myself. Indeed. And meanwhile, I'm uh, my shift starts at 6 a.m. and at, at this moment in time, it was a struggle to get to be able to have us both be awake and coherent enough to do a trucks at the same time. Yeah. Which is kind of a metaphor for the way that our personal trajectories have been going lately. You know, like there was always you know, trucks has developed over the years into a thing where we were, you know, talking about our shared media and uh, experiences and then into a thing where we were sort of talking about our, you know, worries about the world and the personal struggles that we were having. And mm-hmm. now we talk both... about work on it mostly. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, we've both we're both like I I would I don't want to speak for you, but I feel like we're both like in an okay place right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, in addition to us both having uh, goyles that we're excited about, mm-hmm. um, the you know, and like none of my current you know mental health or you know, sort of anxiety struggles are new and interesting. They're all the same ones you know, that you just, one just has to deal with over and over again. So being that we're both in all right places right now, do you think that we can take this trucks as an opportunity to locate any generalizable advice that we can offer to the end of reaching an all right place? It's, I've been thinking about that and the answer is that it's not easy to do, but maybe if we put our heads together, we could arrive at a couple of things. I mean, I think that the, the most important piece of advice that I can offer is don't die. Don't die. Like, and I, and I mean, and I, that sounds flippant, but I mean it seriously. Like, Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, one of the things that I have had to hurdle over time is depression and anxiety. Um, one of the things that depression and anxiety does to a person is that it, uh, makes it very difficult to believe that anything could ever change indeed um and it's like uh which is not to say that change comes easy or quickly you Mm -hmm. know like the work that you've had to do over the past year has not been easy over the past two years really but you know you did it Mm -hmm. bit by bit and there was no great change that happened that allowed you to start doing that it was more work yeah some sort of change occurred over the course of the work although although i could take a stab at it i still kind of struggle to put my finger on it what the change was exactly some kind of adjustment in my outlook my my sense of my self-efficacy i suppose that's really it you know your your one's self-conception changes slowly Mm -hmm. um because a single piece of evidence doesn't really um slowly and then all at once yeah that, that's exactly the point that i was trying to make right yeah um what i was going to say was that you do the work and things change slowly and then change and slowly and slowly and then you discover suddenly that you're capable of doing something that you didn't think that you were capable of doing right you're finally you're placed in a circumstance where you get to prove it to yourself and and then your your reality transforms to a point where it becomes an affirmation of what you've learned about yourself and the skills that you've developed or whatever right exactly it's that confirmation moment um which is what i would if i were to to say you know here's the hope right it's like you do have to do the work and it does feel like you're not actually accomplishing anything but it turns out that as long as you stay alive and keep trying <laughs> you know <laughs> and don't allow yourself to fall back into the pit uh, whatever pit that is you know whatever anesthesia that you're you know giving yourself to preclude you know working on the stuff that's making you miserable um 
that sort of sudden shift in perspective can happen. Yeah. And it's really a beautiful experience when it does. Yes, indeed. Um, and that's real, you know, and you're talking to, and like, I, I say this as an extremely cynical human being, <laughs> but <laughs> um, that is real. And so yeah. I would encourage people to to work toward that, to, you know, and it's like, the reward that you're after is not so much, you know, the personal breakthrough, it's the, it's suddenly realizing that you can do the thing that you didn't think you could. Yeah. Um, and then good things may happen to you. I, I would, yeah, for me it was like, yeah, I, I stepped into a world uh, and nobody in that world uh, seems even to want to guess that I may have like spent nearly a decade in a rut. You know? To, I mean, one, the weirdest the part about becoming a bartender has been accepting all of the compliments. And <laughs> it, it, seems, it seems to be everybody's impression that I've just always been a very capable person. One, one and on some level, I, I suppose the truth is that this capable person was always in there. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the, I mean, one of the advantages of that particular world, I would imagine, would be that you know everybody has, you know, gone through some shit, probably, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and so many of them certainly have. Yeah, uh, there's certainly going to be a level of understanding around that, but yeah, no, I mean, sometimes like changing your circumstances. It's good to know people who, you know, know your history and, you know, can understand you on that level. But it's also good to meet new people who can just enjoy you for what you've become, you know, without the specter of the shit that you, yeah. of that, you know, history of struggle, you know, hanging over it. So it's sort of like a clean check. It's like, oh, this is how I come off now. This is how people react to me now. It's nice. It is nice. It is nice. And it can happen to you, my friends. It can. Like, it can happen to, you know, any of us. Like, um, I'm not going to shout out the specific person in the Discord who was, over the course of the year, went from, I can't see how I'll ever make friends, to, oh, I'm going to hang out with my friends tonight. <laughs> um, but it can happen to you. Even you. Even you. Even you. Even, even you. you. Um, Maybe you. <laughs> human beings in general are capable of a lot more than we think we are even if we are contending with um and here's a takeaway also like being not ideal in various yeah. ways yes most humans are not out to like identify and pick on and resent the ways in which others are imperfect for the most part i find there's a kind of ready well of understanding or you know at usually the very worst case is indifference mm. yes and then there's me um <laughs> <laughs> you know well isaac we all understand that that's just you dealing with your own insecurities and we don't judge you for it uh-huh um, <laughs> sure but uh yeah i mean i can't i can't co-sign that one for obvious reasons but um <laughs> there are meanies out there yeah um but you know i guess really the point i'm trying to make is just um what is the point i'm trying to make something about something about Something about the social anxiety I used to experience and how it was tied into my my lack of self worth, lack of self efficacy. Yeah. yeah. Um, generally, yeah. Generally, people aren't really. It, it it's very easy to feel like people are like chomping at the bit to reinforce your, you know, your self negative shit, you know, and mm. uh, it's easy it's easy to kind of find ways in in your own kind of perception of social events that they did but the truth is that almost everybody is just um 
kind of thinking about themselves in that same way on some level. Yeah, and I think that it's coming at it from my perspective as the mean one. Um, <laughs> You're not really the mean it's, one. You know, but well, there's my my particular insecurity is to think of myself as the mean one. Um, sure, sure. And the uh, and yeah, no, I've been noticing that lately. Is that like most people want not to be do not particularly want to be um, locked in a. Uh, <laughs> We do not know what key sleeping is at the moment. No, um, I was honking at this guy on purpose. Oh yeah, and it worked. Amazing. But this the guy has honk can't mechanics. Hear honk. Um, but uh, the um, what I was trying to say is that most people are don't are not actually interested in playing that game where you store up every um, you know slight that they've mm -hmm. ever perpetrated on you or vice versa um not the way that i learned how to interact with people from my uh mother um which is mm -hmm. to you know arm yourself with every little thing that you can to stoke resentment and then you know release it all at once at the opportune moment right but right right most people the way are i learned how to interact with people from my mother was to notice the ways in which people are not correct about things and mm. use that to somehow stoke my sense of self-worth also yeah. not a good strat and um i guess one of the uh one of the things that i'm noticing lately is that people are going to be liable to forgive you mm -hmm. um because they don't actually want you to be their enemy you know right uh and if you also are not interested in being their enemy, which, for God's sake, why would you be interested in that? <laughs> you know, like, uh-oh, you want to scoot back I'm over hoping, and try to... Yeah, uh, I can like, just bypass yeah. it with this overpass situation. Yeah. We have gotten um, way close to our destination way too quickly, so this is really <laughs> a welcome detour. Yeah, It's been like nothing but a free and open highway this whole journey. <laughs> <laughs> A metaphor, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, but I... Uh, it was, for my part, I then have to ask myself, okay, why are you interested in being enemies with these people <laughs> um, mm -hmm. who annoyed you once or you know, have done things that are not ideal as if you yourself are perfect at all times? Um, right. And, uh, you know, some of them... Some of them I can still delight in uh, abusing, but I'm really starting. I'm really starting to have to ask myself, like, what what's the gain in all this? What's the point? Mm. Because you've it's really tempting to and easy maybe to think that you've burned a bridge because that resolves you the responsibility of you know. Uh, yeah patching it up but uh, I think yeah people are more patient and alone and isolated and fearful and generally unhappy than they seem to be and it's good to keep that in mind when interacting with them a little bit of emotional openness I think this is like in you know speaking back to trying to place the finger on what my takeaway was from therapy experiences uh, a little bit of open em uh, emotional openness goes a long way with people. Yeah, like, showing vulnerability can be the easiest way to diffuse. Yeah, somebody like it works on me. I've noticed, <laughs> uh, and vice versa. Yeah, just and like putting putting it out there, you know. The, yeah. I mean, not to go all like patriarchy hurts us all on things, but like fucking you know fucking puffing out your chest and pretending that you can't be hurt is just like the worst way to interact with the world yes like in pretty much every respect you know mm -hmm. yeah that will mostly have the effect of isolating yourself which is the is the very thing not to do I think the all of the great things in life are found 
in others. Unless it's, you know, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. You can enjoy that in the privacy of your own bedroom. Mm, but indeed. Past a certain point, Lord of the Rings just isn't enough. It's hard to believe, but... <laughs> Uh, Lord of the Rings was never enough. Um. <laughs> anyway, I think there's something I'm trying to drive towards. I don't really know what it is. It has something to do with, oh, you know, I, I've, I've spoken to you a few months ago about how there is something I would like to eventually drive towards, and I'm still kind of trying to figure it out. I think I think it has to do with um, the emotional connections you make with people. They're very real, you know, they have a weight. They kind of, they continue to live inside of both people um, in ways that can never be fully quantified, but um, which, are, which are felt and vibes, Isaac, vibes. You remember <laughs> when we were talking again. about vibes all the time? Yeah. Vibes are real. They've never been realer. Hmm. Josh is feeling the vibes to yeah, a unprecedented vibes. extent. <laughs> All it, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, man, the vibes. Yeah, no, this is me. This is me, kind of waving the white flag in terms of actually coming up with an insightful way to put this. But no, but I, I understand. I, I think that I understand what you're getting at, um, particularly like relative to sort of survival level ways of dealing with the world which tend to be really reductive you yeah. know opening yourself up to the full possibilities of any given encounter uh yeah and it's like i shut myself right down at work um but i think that that's appropriate for what my job is um or how i you know interact with my job i but, can destroy that ambulance so easily <laughs> you could that would that would be a, a i mean this if you you're deciding not to do that might make this an even better uh insight into good and evil than lord of the rings but um no i'm we're all on board with vibes Yeah, I do. I do. I do talk about vibes a fair amount. Um, so much I more. Sorry, here's go ahead. another. Here's another crack at it. So much more is communicated in any encounter between two people than just the content of their words. You know, there's there's a whole there's a whole universe that exists between any two people, even if they're just sort of noticing each other in a space there's there's a very particular emotional configuration to that encounter for both participants and um, that's not to say that you'll always have perfect insight into the other person's right but um, it's worth where you can um, heeding it studying it you know and trying to just pay attention just be attentive to openness the to the world around you is uh, yeah. can be an exhausting and potentially you know fraying thing to do to want to do but it is yeah. really important to remind oneself to go back to that well because um i don't know what else life is for yeah we're gonna i think we're gonna enjoy flying the free cam around this place a little bit in a moment are we if we can I mean, maybe, I don't yeah, really maybe, have maybe, much maybe else this to is talk a short, about, honestly. <laughs> it's a 40-minute... a year-end truck spectacular. Yeah. Yeah, it's not really... I mean, it's not really a spectacular this year. It's more of a... Just a... a little check-in. Yeah, a little look back. Um, because we both... I think we've both changed a lot this year. But yeah. I think that we've done a lot of that on trucks or talked about a lot of those processes. Um, yeah, yeah. Which is... You know, which makes this year's trucks an interesting document, I feel. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was always, we were always deliberate about making trucks a kind of artistic document, but I feel like this year's trucks, even though there's only been, you know, one a month, uh, 
plus the weed trucks. Um, <laughs> there have been has, some bangers. Yeah, has, uh, I think, done a better job of hitting that intention than we had previously done. Mm. I think this year's trucks might be good, all right? Yeah, it's been a good year of trucks, hasn't it? Yeah, which is, you know, it's bec- it's such a different thing than it used to be, which and that I think that's sort of the interest in and of itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What shall we truck about in the future? There is um, besides gay porn. Yeah, besides gay porn, there's something. Um, there's something about being like put on the spot in a like regularly recurring podcast for the like with attention to like personal development and and such. You know, it it, it is uh, my my number one trouble. When, like difficulty encountered while trucking has always been a sense of becoming repetitive mm. and uh, I think maybe on, we these, should, on these topics it is perhaps easier than ever maybe we should continue to open up the trucks to the truckos yeah 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 you know that's a good idea we should we should trucks perhaps uh, as the trucks discord itself has become should perhaps start to be less about us and more about the community and maybe we the an idea the Yuri trucks was sort of the which was a success I think um, might sort of be the first look into what that could be like but I think that you're right in that it is probably time to rethink the project not to end it but to consider what it could be um, given the changes in our selves and in our approaches to this thing Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well right on looking forward to trying some experimental trucks get ready for experimental trucking everybody I agree I agree this uh, 2022 will be the year when trucks gets weird (laughs) (laughs) Uh, and 2023 will be the year of keep trucks weird (laughs) 2023 will be the year where uh, weird gets trucks Uh. (laughs) Okay. Well, happy 2022, everybody. Hope it's uh, hope it's a good one. Yeah. Um, stay alive, and yeah, man. things can change. That's they the sure big can. takeaway. Things can change. Things can change. Good trucking. Bye. Bye. Bye.